Hi, welcome back to my channel. This is Rhea, your study buddy for hematology. And today we are going to talk about thalassemia. This is an important topic in hematology, so please bear with me. First severe cases of thalassemia was discovered in North America by Thomas B. Cooley. Therefore, they named the severe cases Cooley's anemia. And it is still the common term for severe thalassemia until today, which is also known as thalassemia major. So the name thalassemia is from the Greek word thalassa, which means the sea. And this is because most of the cases that were discovered at that time came from the Mediterranean coastal region. But we now know that thalassemia is actually worldwide. And depending on how severe the disease is, it can also be called as thalassemia minima or minor. And if it's the severe case, it's called thalassemia major. Thalassemia is common and present in immigrant populations coming from Italy, Greece, um, West Africa, and Southeast Asia. The worldwide distribution of thalassemia is quite similar to the distribution of malaria because thalassemia, minor that is, gives you somewhat of a protection from the malaria parasites. The malaria parasites could not survive <laughs> in the RBCs in thalassemia patients. So it actually gives them some protection. So the difference between thalassemia and other hemoglobinopathies such as sickle cell disease, hemoglobin C or E, is that there is a defect in the structure of their hemoglobins. Whereas for thalassemia, there is a decrease or absence of the globin chains. Now, depending on what thalassemia you have, there are two main types of thalassemia, which is alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia. Both names are derived for the lack, decrease, or absence of the specific globin chains. So for alpha thalassemia, they have either a decrease a, or a, a complete absence of alpha globin chains. Whereas for beta thalassemia, there is a decrease or an absence of the beta globin chains. And as you can remember, in the synthesis of hemoglobin, we need two alpha chains and two beta chains to create the heme structure. So this is where it gets a bit complicated. We're going to talk about the genetics of the disease this time. So I would highly advise that you go back to my hemoglobin synthesis video where I talk about how hemoglobin is made and how we create hemoglobins throughout our lifespans. What to take away from that lecture is that in order to make a normal hemoglobin structure, you need two alpha chains and two beta chains. And a normal adult will usually have um, 95 to 97% of hemoglobin A. Hemoglobin A is the hemoglobin that's made out of two alphas and two beta chains. Um, a minor amount of hemoglobin A2 will be present in adults as well, just 2.5%. It's made up of two alphas and two delta chains and a small amount of F, hemoglobin F, which is composed of two alpha and two gamma chains. As you can see on this slide, before birth, we produce these different types of hemoglobins, which is the Gower 1, Gower 2, and Portland. And then we hit birth, and we still have our hemoglobin F, which is the fetal hemoglobin. And then adult hemoglobin is made by alpha, uh, two deltas, and then alphas and two beta chains. And that's the really that's the bulk of adult hemoglobin. And that's why it's really important for have to for for us to have um, alphas and beta chains. So so let's summarize the pathophysiology of thalassemia. There is a decrease or absence of one globin chain causing the increase and excess of the unmatched globin chain. So as you can imagine, if you have a defective alpha um, gene, then you will have a lot of betas that are not gonna be paired up, grouped together with the alpha chains because you have an unmatched amount. Um, these genes continue to produce what they would normally do 
um, regardless of whether the alpha chains are defective or not. What I'm trying to say is, even if let's say you have the mutation, right? You don't have the, you have alpha thalassemia where your alpha genes don't produce as much alpha globin chains, your beta chains, your beta gene will continue to produce the amount of beta chains needed. Therefore, you will have an abundance and an imbalance of beta chains in your blood um, or in your globins, globin production compared to how much alpha chains you have. And that is the problem with thalassemia. In the case of alpha thalassemia, you will have an excess of gamma chains and which form hemoglobin BARTs and hemoglobin H, which is a tetramer of beta chains. Um, these are useless and they can't carry oxygen and they actually shorten the lifespan of RBCs. Detection of these hemoglobins are a clue in diagnosing alpha thalassemia. And vice versa is what happens if you have beta thalassemia. That means you're not producing enough beta chains and your alpha chains keep on going and keep getting produced. So now there's an imbalance. You have an abundance of alpha chains and you have a decrease and um, absence or absence of beta chains. In the case of beta thalassemia, you have an excess of alpha chains that also form precipitates that can kill RBC precursors and therefore ineffective erythropoiesis. In homozygous beta thalassemia, there is an increased presence of hemoglobin F. So that makes sense because you don't have beta chains, so you have gamma to step up. Gamma chains will step up, which is a diagnostic clue of beta thalassemia. Okay, so I'm cutting this video right here for now and then I'll upload the continuation to the thalassemia series. It's a lot in one video, so I want you to take a pause right now, you know, take a breather, eat some snacks, and then continue on. So thank you for watching today's video and I'll see you on the next one. Bye!